Hi guys! Today we'll be recapping a story called Cat in the Chrysalis. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps us a lot. Enjoy. Two years ago, she was in the library, and there she saw him at sunset, and she hasn't forgotten him since. Unlike the red hues of the sunset, the man shines like light itself, almost like he's disappearing. True enough, that man no longer exists now. She never even had the chance to learn his name until it was too late. At present, Kit Gerald doesn't understand how everything fell apart. Lonnie Blanche, the man she is currently married to, is thoughtful and handsome, a tailor working in a successful boutique. But there's no reason not to want to be married to him. And yet she can barely stand to look at him now. Not after learning that he had been cheating on her with her sister, Rosaline. She discovered a letter addressed to her sister where her husband was professing his love to her sister. Words that he never once said to Kit. As a child who was treated as a disgrace, her family was filled with misery and despair. But everything changed that day in the library, the day her eyes met with his for the first time. She was so startled that she dropped the book she was holding. She picked it up, and like any romantic love story ever, he did the same, causing their hands to touch. She remembers wanting to thank him, but she never did, choosing to run away instead. But it was the moment she fell in love. Every day for six months, she went to the library to see him, just watching him from afar. She can only gaze upon his expressionless face and try to listen to his beautiful voice. However, he stopped going to the library and she grew worried when she did not see him for days. That is when she learned a news so unbelievable. That man died. OMG, poor Kit. Her first love ended so tragically and she hasn't even talked to him yet. Edwin Arthur Windsor was his name a name she had only come to know after he was gone. He was a prince, passing away after his carriage overturned. At his funeral, tears flowed endlessly down her cheeks. She wondered if he even had any idea about how she felt. On the fifth day of the 10th month, year 263, her first love died in vain. Currently, the only thing that can ease her pain is the thoughts of her first love, Edwin. As she drifts off to sleep, she can only wonder what would have changed if she just talked to him, if only she could see him once again. She is then awakened by a familiar mocking voice. She is shocked to see Rosaline, for she hasn't lived with her for years. But then she realizes that she is back at her old house. Kit has no time to react to this bizarre situation appropriately, because she is being dragged by her sister, who informs her that their father is discussing her marriage with someone. Rosaline even comments her disbelief that someone is willing to take her as a wife. Ugh! This woman is as nasty as I imagined. I know that the story is just starting, but I despise her already. When she is led to a room where their father is, she is astounded to see Lonnie there, looking younger and giving her the brightest of smiles. She finally understood that this was the time when she first met her supposed husband. Did she go back into the past? As Lonnie continues to talk to her, she recognizes all the things he is saying and even knows the exact moment when he asks her to marry him. She remembers the time she had spent being his wife, how he insulted her and belittled her capabilities. If she has indeed returned to the past, she won't let that happen to her again. So without further ado, she straight up tells him no. She does not wish to marry him. When she finishes those words, the look on everyone's face is priceless. Lonnie graciously apologizes for imposing on her, and Kit apologizes in turn for making him feel bad. Despite the awkward situation they are in, her mind is filled with questions. What could be the reason why she was sent to the past? Is it so she could stop her disastrous marriage, or perhaps to save Edwin? She will make sure that Edwin will not die this time. She quickly makes her way to the library, and sure enough, Edwin is there. For the first time, she approaches him with an odd expression on her face. She reaches to touch his face, and when she feels his warmth, tears begin uncontrollably falling. He really is alive! Unexpectedly, she is pulled out of her reverie when he slaps her hand away and angrily asks her what she is doing. Before she can even reply, he walks away from her. Oh, I see now. This guy has some attitude. You may be incredibly handsome, mister, but be gentle to people. You could have at least asked her what's up. Kit grabs his sleeves and tells him that she has to talk to him, but he gives her the most terrifying gaze ever before telling her to stop being a nuisance and let him go. She does as she's told and even tries to apologize, but he continues to walk away. See? He's so rude. However, Kit still tries to cut him some slack because she is admittedly acting a bit crazy. 
she considers his reaction normal because after all, she is a stranger who just touched his face and cried in front of him for no reason. However, she is still determined to keep him alive. So the next day, she goes to the library again, and upon seeing Edwin, she greets him politely. He ignores her, of course, so she blocks his view of his book to get his attention. She tries to explain that she has something to tell him, but he doesn't want to hear it. He merely tells her to go away. But Kit is not having it. She quickly goes around to block his way, emphasizing how important it is that he listens to her. Edwin is annoyed more than ever, even calling her Miss Crybaby. However, before he can continue talking, she blurts out that he mustn't get on the carriage going to the royal palace for he'll die. Edwin is surprised, to say the least, but not for the reason we all think. But his expression goes back to his usual haughty one and tells her that everyone dies someday. Kit is confused because how can someone who has been told about his death react like this? When she goes quiet, Edwin takes the opportunity to ask her a question. He wants to know how she knew he was going to the palace. She struggles to answer for obvious reasons, because telling someone that you're a time traveler is never easy, guys. Edwin begins to walk away again, telling her to never think about him again, but she reaches to pull on his sleeve and tells him she can explain. With no more hesitation, she tells him the truth. She explains that since she went back in time, she thought it would be nice to save him. Despite her explanation, Edwin is still giving her the same scary expression. For her obvious concern for him, he flat out assumes that she's in love with him. Kit is overwhelmed by his straightforwardness, and she still struggles to give him a clear answer. He assumes that he is correct, seeing as she has become so flustered, but she denies it. He tells her that if the only reason she is doing this out of pity, then he can't do this favor for her. He turns away from her again, but she blocks his way once again before confessing that she does love him, shocking Edwin to the core. But Edwin's rudeness knows no bounds, and even though Kit has used her courage to confess to him, he laughs at her for thinking it'll change things. Kit is shocked when Edwin makes it known that he wants to die again, and he wants everyone who likes him to suffer for it. Gosh, he is kind of dark, isn't he? I don't know what he's going through, but he clearly needs an attitude adjustment. Kit wants to ask him something, and he will only allow her if she promises not to disturb him again. With devastation clearly seen on her face, she asks him why he was so impatient to die. The answer he gives her astounds her, and she is left dumbfounded. At home, she still can't believe the words that he whispered to her. Salvation. That's what he will gain if he dies, a way to escape his miserable life. Hmm, Edwin is clearly in pain. I wonder what's causing him to think so negatively about life. That night, she had a strange dream. It is the memory of her weeping over the corpse of her beloved Edwin. But then standing behind her is a man she had never seen before. A man who for some reason looks identical to Edwin, only with longer hair and a slight stubble. Confused, she heads to the library to find Edwin. Despite his indifference, she pleads with him not to take the carriage. He remains unmoved, claiming he has nothing to live for. Desperate, Kit professes her love for him, but he mocks her. Just as she's about to give up, she spots a figure from her dream behind Edwin. He too sees it and grabs her, astonished. It's her first time seeing such a thing, and she confesses she dreamed of him before. Surprisingly, he grabs her hand and leads her somewhere else. Even in this situation, Kit is still distracted by the fact that he is holding her hand. <laughs> Even in this chaos, she still gets flustered by his simple hand holding. How cute, even though Edwin is so grumpy. When they get outside away from people, Edwin wants her to confirm that it was indeed her first time seeing the ghost. He also wants to know what the ghost looked like, so she describes the man's appearance, especially the fact that he looked similar to him. Edwin is even more stunned when he learns that Kit can see the ghost's face. He is so destabilized by the situation that he has to sit down. The fact that Kit can see the ghost's face doesn't make sense to him, especially since that man is his father. The ghost is a late king, and Kit has definitely seen that man before as a child. Suddenly, she sees the ghost again, and it's looking directly at them. The apparition then utters the words, You must live. And when Kit repeats what he has said, Edwin is stunned once again. Right then, the ghost disappears. Kit then asks him if he knows the reason why the ghost is watching over him, even telling him that she'll help him. But of course, Edwin being Edwin questions her motives again. She can only tell him the truth, and it is that she doesn't want him to be in pain. With a sigh, he tells her that he will not ride the carriage, but in return, they must make a deal. The following day, it is October 5th, the original date of Edwin's death. Kit frantically stops Edwin from riding a carriage. She reminds him that he promised that he would not ride it. 
Edwin then snatches his arm from her and replies that he is rather good at keeping his promises. He is simply handing a letter to the coachman to be delivered to the palace. When the carriage leaves, he notices that she's crying again, another testament to the nickname he gave her. But they are happy tears, for she is so relieved that he didn't die. He merely stares at her in silence for a moment before telling her to go back because he doesn't want to see her crying face. Kit is happy to comply, but when she's about to leave, he stops her. He then covers her head with a jacket, telling her that he doesn't want to see her face. Jeez, the Zundere vibe coming from this guy is off the roof. She is making her way home. Kit remembers the terms of their agreement. Edwin agrees to not ride the carriage, only if she promises to tell him what the ghost will be saying from then on. She easily agrees, for she is happy at the prospect of him not dying. But this is short-lived, for he tells her that things that are supposed to happen will happen eventually, implying that he'll die no matter what. He knows that fate cannot be changed. The next day, Kit is horrified that she has slept in, especially since she is supposed to go to the library. However, even though she's making haste, everything doesn't go according to plan because of an unexpected visit. When she opened the door, she was greeted by the angelic smile of one Lonnie Blanche. Her father, the Marquise, has ordered a dress for her to wear on her 19th birthday. As Lonnie does his job, she can't help but remember glimpses of their past together. She knows that their marriage has been doomed from the start. When he is done, he smiles at her brightly, and all she can think about is that regardless of how he was once the source of her happiness, she cannot risk getting close to him a second time. By the time she arrives in the library that day, Edwin has already left, leaving behind the book he is always reading. It is entitled The Sequence in the Loop. It is about the tragic love story of Bella and Arthur. The lead male dies in a car accident, and the lead female intends to follow him to the afterlife. But before she can, Arthur appears as a ghost, telling her to live on. Kit can't help but notice the uncanny similarity between this story and Edwin's situation. The next day, Kit is sitting awkwardly beside the prince before she utters an apology for being busy yesterday. But he doesn't want to deal with her, especially because she can't keep promises. It turns out that he had assumed that they'd be seeing each other yesterday. Incredulously, she asks him if he was waiting for her yesterday. Edwin, of course, is quick to deny this because God forbid a girl assumes that he has feelings. He claims that he is merely annoyed when people don't keep their promises. Kit then talks about the book he is reading and mentions how similar he is to the protagonist of the story. Edwin reveals that the book is his father's favorite. Hearing this has Kit thinking, can this novel be the key to solving Edwin's situation? However, Edwin does not want her to meddle with his life. He angrily reminds her that he only asked her to tell him what the ghost says. Edwin is so annoyed that he attempts to leave, but right at that moment, the ghost appears before them. When he speaks, Edwin instantly demands Kit to relay the message. But Kit sees this as an opportunity. She'll only tell him the message if he'll research the book with her. When she realizes what she just said, Kit is beyond embarrassed because her words can easily be mistaken as an invitation for a date. Edwin is not happy that she is threatening him with this, but she insists that she only wants to help him. Edwin has a defeated expression on his face when he agrees, and so the two of them act like detectives the whole day, searching for clues high and low. After they're done for the day, they settle at a nice cafe to rest. She expresses her gratitude for giving in to her request, but he points out that it's more like a threat than a request. He also makes it absolutely clear that he was only doing it so that he would know what his father said. Now that she's noticed that Edwin keeps on calling her Miss Crybaby, she asks him if he even knows her name, to which he answers a resounding no. How can you not know her name? <laughs> You've been spending time together for the past few days. She tells him that she knows his name, and he answers that's because he's a prince, so she can't possibly compare since everyone in the kingdom knows his name. She can only smile indulgently at him and mention that even though that's the case, his name is still special to her. The prince is silent after that, but then after a while he speaks, saying that her name is Cat, short for Kitty Gerald. He is wrong, of course, but this is not what causes her to tear up. Her grandmother, who was the only person to ever really care for her, used to call her Kitty rather than Kit. She thought that she would never hear that nickname again, but here was the prince, calling her that again. Edwin is distraught that he made her cry for saying the wrong name, so she explains the truth of the name to him. Edwin then tells her that he is sick of seeing her cry. Right then, Kit remembers that she is supposed to tell the prince what the ghost said earlier. She tells him that the ghost's words were, I'm sorry. Kit begins crying again, only because her grandma also said that to her before she passed away. Suddenly, she feels a handkerchief wiping away her tears. The prince is acting all sweet for once. 
However, in textbook Zundere fashion, he makes it seem like it's not a big deal. Oh, Edwin, you frustrating cutie. Get yourself together. Kit is questioning if it is normal to have recurring dreams. As she slumbers, she dreams of Edwin and the childhood he once had. She sees him happily hugging a woman who seems to be his mother. Suddenly, the man who she often sees as a ghost is beside her, watching the scene unfold like her. All of a sudden, the scene shifts and they are now in a much solemn event, the funeral of the late king himself. Young Edwin's grief is visible for all to see as his tears flow freely. The ghost then tells her to bring him salvation. When she wakes up, she's confused. And early that morning, all she wants to do is go to Edwin because of the dream. But they don't have plans and she fears he'll get angry. But she can't really go out anyway because it's also the day that Lonnie will be bringing her dress. When he arrives, he wears the most dashing of smiles as he greets her. He hands her the dress and asks her to try it on. When she is done, she steps out to ask for his opinion, but he only gapes at her in total silence for a moment. He then stands up and takes her hand, telling her how beautiful she is. She snatches her hand back and bashfully thanks him for the compliment. She tries to dismiss him, but he suddenly grabs her wrist in a tight hold. Kit is surprised that Lonnie is acting this way, especially since his gaze is so intense. When he finally speaks, he reasons that he happens to see a loose thread of her dress and only intends to fix it. I am sensing so much creepy vibes on this, y'all. Am I the only one who thinks that he is hiding something? Kit is familiar with Lonnie's habit of fixing things on the spot, but he is also clumsy and he's often pricked by the needle while doing so. Out of habit, she reminds him to use a thimble. It was too late at that point when she realized how random that was. Lonnie, to her surprise, looks elated to hear that she's concerned about him, even calling her cute for it. This behavior of his is far from the ones she's used to. She vividly remembers him criticizing and downright insulting her every time she suggested things out of concern. He was really nasty during their marriage, wasn't he? How can he act like this and still end up like that in the future? It really is hard to trust anyone. After it's done, Lonnie asks her to invite him to her birthday party, for he wants to see her wear the dress he made for her. Even though she wants to refuse, she still nods yes to him out of courtesy. Lonnie might not be the same as the one she knew, but it is still hard for her to forget everything. She then claims that she is not feeling that well, so Lonnie instantly packs up so she can rest. But before he can exit, she remembers the dream she had last night, and so she calls out to Lonnie, asking him what he knows about Edwin. Lonnie then asks if she is referring to the abandoned prince. Based on Kit's rather bewildered expression, Lonnie correctly guesses that the lady has not heard of the story that surrounds the supposed abandoned prince. Her reactions do confirm that Kit never knew of Prince Edwin's status in life, and so Kit proceeds to round off a bunch of questions regarding him and the late king. It then comes to her realization that she never bothered to learn anything about Edwin in her previous and current life at all. First, because she usually stays at her home, but also because she had no one to talk to her about things like this. The same thing persists even after he died, to which the only conclusion Kit gets is that she loved the prince she met that golden afternoon, the person in the library. Still, now deciding to help Edwin, she vows to take that step now, to find out why after the death of the king, he, as the natural successor, didn't come to inherit the throne, and is now instead living away from the capital. And from all the peculiar sources of answers, Kit gets hers from Lonnie. The tailor starts the story after the late King Lich Windsor had died suddenly during Edwin's childhood. Of course, with the sudden death of their ruler and an underage successor, the country fell into disarray. Until there is apparently a single person who managed to take hold of the confusion and disperse it, and that was Benson Windsor, the now current king, coincidentally, the late King Lich's younger brother. Kit curiously asks why it didn't just go to Edwin, as it should have, but Lonnie thinks it's because the current King Benson has always been a master at dealing with political means. And what's more, though it seems he's teasing Edwin at first, it also may be because of the prince's bad manners. Even those devoted to keeping the royal line intact eventually soured their relations with the young prince. As to why he's been left in the outskirts of some town instead of the royal palace, Lonnie drops the biggest piece of news. After Benson's rise to the throne, along with his policies that won the entire empire over to him, he married the late king's wife. To be more precise, Edwin's mother was the one who proposed to Benson and had become his wife. It's controversial in and of itself, but it's even more so when she remarried right after her husband, Lich, died. Naturally, the scandal becomes one of the biggest sources of gossip among the country. Honestly, anywhere you go, you can't get rid of gossipers. Get it? 
Gossip plus worshippers? Oh, never mind. Anyway, after the royal wedding, Edwin finds himself there in the town as if he was chased out of the palace, earning him the nickname of the Abandoned Prince. Kit can't even comprehend the things she just heard, and Lonnie then asks her why her interest suddenly lay on the prince, seeing how dejected she was upon hearing his life story. She excuses it as just seeing the prince in the library, though Lonnie seems not at all convinced. Nonetheless, he excuses himself, leaving Kit to her own thoughts. Thoughts that circle entirely about how much pain the young prince must have gone through, and why is it that she can see the late king's ghost as well? Anyway, her laundry comes, delivered by her maids, and with it comes the handkerchief Edwin had given her. She manages to find the nickname Ed or Eddie embedded on it, and happily thinking it would bring him joy upon its return, Kit happily goes to see Edwin. However, with his mother's face ringing in his memories after Kit says his nickname out loud, the prince declares such a thing is something he doesn't need anymore. Even with the prince's apparent rejection of the handkerchief's value to him, Kit still stays bubbly as ever and asks whether she can keep it instead, to which Edwin eventually relents and says yes to. He turns his back to her, and like previous times, his voice starts to get a little bit louder when he finds Kit to be too annoying, making the latter grab his mouth and ask that they be quiet. They are in a library after all. Anyway, Kit clutches a certain envelope in hand, and it seems she's building up the courage to give it to Edwin. She starts first by asking why the prince didn't make plans with her after their supposed agreement to talk to the ghost. But right in the midst of their rather cute banter, Kit finds Edwin staring straight at her. Not in any sort of romantic way, but in a rather quizzical manner. He then asks whether or not they've seen each other before, to Kit's surprise, simply because she's shocked that Edwin does remember their first meeting. But apparently, it's only because the ghost was at her side during that moment. He doesn't even remember her face, only the fact that she was next to his late father's spirit. Speaking of the ghost, in a very cute manner, Kit sees that he's been watching them the whole time, and in a bit to be helpful, it motions the nervous Kit to give the letter to Edwin. So, safe to say, Kit has Edwin's father's vote. That's definitely a plus. Quite expectedly, she gets flustered and even says that she can't do that, but the ghost has one more thing it tries to do before disappearing. Getting closer and reaching for his son's face, the ghost seems to mutter the words, I love you, and so much more, and only Kit manages to catch them. Edwin asks whether or not his father was there, and Kit, knowing the late king has pushed her to do it herself, makes a deal with him to relay what his father said if he attended her birthday party. Edwin accepts, making Kit spend the entire party on the lookout for him. Although it seems Rosaline is taking the spotlight despite it being Kit's birthday. She doesn't bother with her though, as Kit, finding herself on the balcony, still anxiously hopes for the prince to show up. Suddenly, a voice from behind calls out to her, and Kit immediately turns, wanting for it to be Edwin. All her excitement from wanting to see Edwin come to answer her invitation fades away, as the person who comes to see her is in fact, Lonnie. To his credit, Lonnie genuinely seems concerned enough to ask why Kit is alone in the balcony. Unfortunately for him, the only thought in Kit's head is the fact that Edwin probably wouldn't come, but she feigns that she's just tired. Regardless, it creates an awkward silence between the two of them, something that Lonnie seems eager to break. He speaks first, saying that he may have been late to the party, but he personally went to find her to give her a present he made himself, along with congratulations for her 19th birthday. Lonnie coughs rather suddenly, making Kit immediately suggest that he should wear a scarf because he gets cold easily, letting it slip that she knows Lonnie on a more personal level. Kit manages to get in the clear, though, when Lonnie just assumes that he has told her that before. However, perhaps Lonnie sees this as a moment or a chance to pursue his advances towards Kit again, and so he starts to get closer to her, even reciting what could have been a really romantic speech. But at that moment, the very man that Kit longed for all night appeared though not in a very proper way. Seeing Kit and Lonnie almost hug, Edwin steps in between the two and loudly asks what kind of birthday party this was. It turns out the prince had arrived a little earlier and had been searching for Kit the whole time. It seems he's a bit sour on the fact that she's invited him, but she didn't show manners by receiving him. Really, we're talking about manners now? You're one to talk about manners, buddy. Anyway, even if Edwin specifically states that he's not there for her, but for what his father said, Kit feels relieved all the same. But of course, they're not the only ones who's there on the balcony. The two men regard each other very differently, with Lonnie being proper with the prince and Edwin with his trademark bad manners. Soon enough, Rosaline, being the attention seeker that she is, makes her way into the very same balcony in order to make her presence known to the prince. 
but in a rather funny way, Edwin just told the two to essentially piss off as he is there to talk to Kit and Kit only. He grabs her hand and drags her to a more secluded place in Kit's estate, a room that's only illuminated by the moonlight with the sole purpose of asking Kit about what his father had said. But Kit can only think about how handsome the prince looks, so much so in his formal wear. Kit relays to Edwin that his father had said the word forgive, and she watches in shock as she sees the prince almost go erratic, arguing over and over how his father could possibly want him to forgive when Edwin blames him for everything. Not once had he lived a normal life after his death, and Edwin himself is sure that the ghost is the one to influence Kit to save him. Despite all that, all the efforts of his father, he declares that he will die over and over again. The statement from the prince himself that he will die again and again indicates that he has passed away more than once, and perhaps possibly had traveled through time just like Kit, something she comes to realize. Although, in actuality, Edwin is a bit surprised that the ghost hasn't told Kit about the true nature of his situation. Rather inexplicably, the prince cannot escape from death. If he escapes the carriage incident, then an even more gruesome death awaits him after that. With his cold, expressionless face, he reveals that he's been stuck reliving the 18th year of his life over and over again. But rather than be speechless about what is perhaps the most shocking thing a person can hear, Kit instead reaches for the prince's hand, earnestly asking for more details. This softens Edwin's expression somewhat, though he admits it will be a very long story. And so, the two make their way to the prince's estate, where his butler, Richard, stands in shock to see Edwin bring home a young maiden. He excitedly assumes that Kit is his girlfriend, but the suggestion is met with a lot of denials. That doesn't mean he will stop assuming that there's a romantic connection between the two, however. Anyway, before Kit formally introduces herself, Richard comments that he now learns of the reason as to why the prince had gone out dressed rather fashionably. Afterwards, Kit and Edwin find themselves sitting in front of each other by the fireplace, with a rather awkward atmosphere thickening in the air. All Richard's fault, really. The only thing in Kit's mind, though, is the idea of how much pain Edwin must have gone through, dying over and over like that. The prince picks up on her rather down mood, and so he asks her about it. Kit is quick to dismiss it, and instead asks that she learn more about the prince's situation. Edwin first sets up a couple of ground rules before they can do that, though. Namely, first, Kit must not interfere with his life now that she knows he's destined to die a whole lot throughout the year. And secondly, she must not assume that he's telling her all this out of some romantic connection perhaps pertaining to Richard's antics. Though Kit just finds it cute when Edwin inadvertently makes a peace sign when explaining. It's okay, Kit. We find him cute, too. With all that out of the way, he finally reveals that after essentially being exiled after his father's death, the royal family suddenly sends a carriage for an event happening at the palace. It's where he meets his first demise, but he surprisingly wakes up a week earlier every time he dies. But what's more important is that he manages to see the ghost of his father after coming back, the same as Kit. Although admittedly, the more he dies, the less he gets to see and hear him. If he manages to avoid the carriage, he then dies by poison. All in all, he has returned to live a total of nine times. Ten if Kit hadn't stopped him this time around. But that is actually what's most curious to him, the fact that in this instance, Kit had come to intervene and save him. Edwin recalls the fact that Kit had assumed that their current situation, the prince more than anything, seems to resemble that of the book his late father was fond of. Unfortunately, even after the numerous times he has reread the book, across all his lifetimes, Edwin has yet to find a clue about it. The only change he's managed to find even remotely related to the book is when he was reading it out of habit, Kit approached him. Kit, on the other hand, comes to realize that even though she has grown affection for him out of all this time, she probably was to him nothing more but one of the passerbys. Anyway, Edwin comments how apart from that, it's strange that she can see his father's ghost, and also the fact she stops him from dying. Kit starts to retort back, but Edwin cuts her off, assuming that the reason again must be because of love again. To his credit, he doesn't mock her because of it this time, but merely says that people are indeed pushed to unimaginable things out of love. Their conversation is broken, however, when Richard comes into the room with the tea he's prepared. The butler briefly makes a comment about how his master has managed to know about something first. To which Edwin replies that he has no idea what he's talking about. It's then Richard's turn to be confused, as apparently he assumed Edwin had asked for the carriage to be dismissed because he already knew that the event would be cancelled, as per the letter that arrived only today. He was only asking how the prince managed to learn it would be cancelled beforehand. Without giving anything away, Edwin gives permission to Richard to leave, but in actuality, 
He's spiraling down a mix of emotions, particularly disbelief at how out of all the times he's been back in time, this is the only instance that things have changed. He reveals that no matter what happens, the event was never canceled before, and so a flicker of hope arises in him about how enough small actions could cause the gears of his fate to change entirely. He isn't the only one getting excited, though, as Kit then offers to help change it some more, starting with avoiding his poisoning. Edwin, understandably, reminds her that she's overstepping her promise of not interfering, but Kit reminds him that this time, he's not alone. Those words seem to have an effect on the prince, and so Edwin eventually agrees. Kit then spends the entire night studying about various poisons, before noticing the birthday gift from Lonnie that remained unopened. Curiosity wins in her, and she opens it, finding a beautiful blue dress inside. The blue dress that Lonnie had made with such high-quality fabric makes melancholy crawl right into Kit's face. She seems to remember how he mentioned that he had been late because he was working on something, and that particular something must have been that dress. The thoughts from her previous life suddenly rush forward, along with the question of whether or not her husband from another life truly has feelings for her in this one. But even if that's the case, she hardens her nerves as she remembers the very reason as to why their relationship eventually crumbled. Anyway, she has something to do today, namely helping Edwin avoid his current fate of dying from poison. Richard is the one who greets her at the door, and it's rather cute how the butler still tries to assume that she's the prince's girlfriend. But moving to the task at hand, both Edwin and Kit's first move is to figure out who is going to feed the poison to the prince directly. And unfortunately, the butler is at the forefront of that suspect list. However, they quickly manage to dispute this suspicion, along with those attached to Edwin's maid, Mary, because both of his servants have been his companion all the way back to his days living in the royal palace. According to Edwin, the poison that the killers will use is something that's not acquired very easily, leading the two to conclude that perhaps whoever poisoned him will be working for a benefactor of some sorts to afford the poison. Despite their very topic, Edwin doesn't seem to be very cautious about whatever he drinks, though, as right after Mary brings them their tea, Kit is shocked and rather scared to find the prince already sipping away at his cup. It seems that he's already very accepting towards death, something that Kit asks him to stop doing. Turns out, he does have a very good reason for doing so, as he knows the killers would only poison him the moment he least expects. But when Kit reaches for her own cup of tea, terror fills the prince's face as he swats away her drink, asking why she thinks it's okay for her to take a sip. Even though she was shocked, Kit tries to wipe the splattered tea from the prince's face, but without so much as a proper explanation, he suggests she just go home for the day. This naturally leaves the poor Kit wondering whether or not she did something wrong. In fact, she is so lost in thought that she wanders into the downtown area instead of heading home. But as if fate is toying with her, she arrives at Lonnie's tailoring shop, only to find Richard inside, apparently acquaintances with her husband from her past life. The sight of Richard and Lonnie together seems to be a little bit more than what Kit can handle at the moment, leaving her staring at the window through the tailor shop. Lonnie is the first to notice her standing outside, and so he rushes to her in order to happily ask her about the circumstances of why she is there. Having again to lie her way around her ex-husband in her past life, Kit can only say that she feels bad about suddenly leaving him all those nights ago during her birthday. The tailor instead offers her some tea, if that is the case, but Kit tries to politely refuse, seeing as Lonnie already has a guest to entertain. But when the two look back at the shop, they see Richard happily waving back at them, and so Lonnie assumes that he wouldn't mind if Kit joins them. Anyway, he himself admits how it was lonely when she abruptly left all those nights before, so a rather guilty Kit has no choice. Inside, while waiting for her preferred black tea, she turns to talk to Richard, who she finds was there with a suitcase full of the prince's orders. Apparently, he was tasked by the prince for this errand and had become quite good acquaintances with Lonnie in the process, who both admit his tailoring is of superior skill. The topic of conversation eventually goes to Richard, asking how Kit had come to be friends with the prince, even as the butler admits that his master isn't what one would consider friendly. Thinking about Edwin's previous reaction to her earlier, Kit seems to think things between them are more rocky now than ever, so she says that they're just acquaintances who met at the library a few times. With that, she excuses herself in order to leave, but Lonnie manages to catch her on the way out. It seems that the young man isn't done giving her gifts. This time, he brings her a brooch that is a beautiful pairing with the dress he had made for her, along with one request. He asks the lady to visit him wearing the dress and the brooch whenever she has the chance, all the while not leaving her a chance to talk. That isn't what sticks in her mind anyway, as the following morning, she mulls over Richard's apparently guarded demeanor yesterday and of how she isn't supposed to meet the prince today. Still, old habits do indeed die hard, and so Kit finds herself at the library trying to run into Edwin. 
She instead finds the book he's reading, and she feels a sense of longing after reading from it, causing her to call out his name. All of a sudden, Edwin answers, revealing that he's standing right behind her. When asked about how she's acting like a child who broke the vase on the table, she honestly tells him that she's sorry for angering him last time. Edwin's face can't be funnier. He looks like software trying to process what she said. He then sits beside her with his face in the opposite direction, shyly expressing himself that he's not mad and that he was just worried that something would happen to her after drinking that tea. Kit didn't seem to hear it well, didn't she? So Edwin slams his hand and exclaims that he wasn't worried at all, emphasizing that he just doesn't like when people get hurt because of him, though he ends up making her promise not to just eat or drink random things. Uh, someone's contradicting themselves? Kit laughs with tears of joy and relief, leaving him dumbfounded at her reaction. She can't help but to just be happy. After all the nasty things he said, for once, he expressed something sweet and kind. She really is a crybaby. Shortly after, they get into Mary's room back in the mansion and show her the pocket watch and a fountain pen, both with his initials that he finds in Mary's cabinet. But since Kit's face paints a clueless expression, Edwin is obliged to explain that Mary likes him. He's quite a narcissist, isn't he? Or maybe he's good at objectifying his appearance. Kit then tells him that it is impossible for her to be the culprit since she likes him, but he immediately brushes off that idea, saying that not everyone expresses their love the way she does. But considering it was the case and that Mary's innocent, the only person left is his butler Richard. That only means they should be more careful. As he holds her hand to assist her in getting up, he strongly makes it clear that he doesn't want anyone dying because of him, so she shouldn't involve herself too much. But even if she can't be sure things are going to change, she still wishes for him to live. Before leaving the room, he then clarifies that he will see her tomorrow. He may act nonchalant or rude all the time, but he is quite mindful of the little things, so she doesn't have to worry about it. The next morning, as she brushes her hair, her gaze locks on the dress and brooch that Lonnie gave her. She then realizes that it's time to finally end things. Shortly after, she goes to Edwin's mansion, where Richard awaits by the door, but dazzled by how stunning her beauty is. Richard must have been so noisy that Edwin comes by the door and scolds him, explaining that he has a thing called taste. Yeah, she was so much to his taste that he had to come out and see her, right? When they settle inside, Edwin reveals that the time is quite weird at the moment. It is because at this time of day, the poison always kicks in followed by his death. Evidently, Kit is still uncomfortable hearing the word death, but Edwin just casually tells her that poison comes in a lot of forms, so it's up to him whether he can avoid it or not. At first, there were two main suspects, Mary and Richard, but from their previous investigation, Edwin became certain that it wasn't Mary. If they assume that an outsider was not responsible for this incident, then the most suspicious person right now is Richard. If he is the culprit, then he will bring poison tea to the table. Kit clenches her fists and straightforwardly exclaims that they just have to be cautious of the tea he'll bring. Uh, as if that's as easy as it will be? She then proposes an idea to send Richard on an errand and Edwin is welcome to stay at her house. Wait, what? Edwin didn't seem to hear that well, so she distracts him into thinking that Richard is at the door and that she will open it for him. But when she does, Lonnie surprises her. What is this person doing here? He should be fed to the lions. Lonnie recognizes the dress and brooch she's wearing, which is totally bad for Kit. After meeting with Edwin, she was planning to find Lonnie and end things with him, but she can't believe that he came there himself. On the other hand, Lonnie looks so happy that she kept her promise to wear it. Indeed, she looks even more beautiful in whatever Lonnie makes. Edwin notices the awkward atmosphere, and maybe jealousy? So he ruins it. That's really a good way to interrupt a moment they should never have in the first place. If Lonnie was just being mauled. Kit gets curious about the new delivered suit, so she inspects the fabric and notices the brooch pinned on the left side. She touches it and gets confused as to why blood springs out of her finger. At this moment, Edwin knows what's going on, but he manages to stay calm. In Lonnie's defense, it seems like the brooch wasn't properly stitched on, so he reaches for her hand, instructing her to wash it first. But Edwin smacks his hand. Edwin can't be angrier. After all, that outfit was supposed to be worn by the prince of the nation, but the lady got hurt by just mere touching it? Is that all his skills amount to? Lonnie apologizes as Edwin tries to hold Kit's hand, worried that she might be feeling nauseous or dizzy. However, Kit strongly implies that she is really fine, perfectly fine. Seeing how she has the energy to talk so enthusiastically, it seems like she really is fine. 
With all the talk, she suddenly collapses. For the first time, he holds her body together. He calls her by her name Kit as he tries to wake her up. Lonnie is such an evil in disguise. Does this mean he's been the killer the whole time? As time passes by, so does she. On the day of her burial, Edwin recalls the time when she promised that they would be on this journey together. Even though she died because of him, he can't do anything but to offer a single flower. Now he thinks that he's an incompetent prince. No, Edwin, this isn't your fault. You didn't ask for this. Looking back, he took the case to the court, but the judicial system found no sufficient evidence. Since no poison could be found on the victim's body, the cause of death was unclear. Therefore, the court found the defendant, Lonnie Blanche, not guilty. Although he's confined to the borders of the kingdom, it's not enough to warrant them completely disregarding his statements. Suddenly, a thought comes to mind. There must be someone who is able to control the judiciary. When he looks up, he sees Lonnie attending the burial. Without a second thought, Edwin's fist lands on Lonnie's face. That's right, he deserves it. Who is he to make such a sad expression like that? Does he really have the right to be sad? She literally died because of him. Edwin can't contain his anger this whole time, and Lonnie isn't even defensive about it. He admits that it's all his fault. Edwin is even more agitated at this point. He then asks for the name of the person who's behind all this. Lonnie says he didn't know that there was poison on the brooch, which is basically the same thing he's been saying the whole time. So the question still remains, who killed Kit? Despite the pouring rain and raging hearts, Lonnie manages to laugh about it. He then points out that Edwin was the person who killed her. If it wasn't for him, she would still be alive. Excuse me, sir? Are you trying to say that Edwin ordered someone to smear poison on the suit so she could touch it and die? However, at this point, Edwin wonders what would be Kit's response if he told her that she'd die if she involved herself with his death. Definitely, Kit would have said something like, if it's for him, then she wouldn't care about things like death. At this moment, he only realizes how important she is after losing her. If he had realized it sooner, who knows, he might have treasured her even more. Days later, an assassin kills him in his room, saying that it would have been great if he died from poison like before. Before? Does someone else know about his regression? However, Edwin doesn't care about that. For the first time, he wishes to live. He doesn't want eternal rest, and he just wants to live together with her. He then calls out a god, if there's one out there, to save her. That is, if he can still go back to the past. This is already heartbreaking as it is, and now he's gambling everything just to go back to the past and see her again. It really is true when people say that when someone's dying, they follow the same pattern like recalling memories at their last moments. But suddenly, somewhere, Edwin's father reaches for the pages of the book as time turns back itself to when Kit had her 19th birthday party. At first, Kit is just confused if she was just dreaming or not because she can still recall the past. Just as when Lonnie approaches her, Edwin rushes to her side and hugs her so tightly with a worried face and cracking voice. Kit is even more confused because she doesn't know what's going on and what has gotten into him. But Edwin just tells her not to move or think about escaping from his arms. He just wants to stay like that for a while. Kit's face starts to turn red, unable to think of anything aside from the embarrassment of the people watching the two of them. Yes, and our eyes are bawling out at how Edwin looked for her the moment he realized that his wish was granted. Kit is insisting that they shouldn't stay like that for long because rumors might spread, so Edwin carries her in a bridal style as they make their exit. Is this some practice for something greater, like marriage perhaps? As they settle somewhere far from the crowd, Kit is in panic about where to put her hands because it's her first time experiencing something like this. Edwin then calls her a work of art. Kit didn't quite notice it, but we did. When Edwin finds out that she's still the Miss Crybaby who returned to the past after her death, Kit now realizes that Edwin regressed like always and that she was the one who got poisoned. In his case, he would have avoided the assassination and it must have hurt a lot more than poison, but why did he take it? Edwin faces the opposite direction again, shyly expressing that he wasn't confident as his cheeks turn red. Or maybe he just doesn't want to lose you again, Kit. Because of too much embarrassment, he then acts like himself, pointing his finger at her as he exclaims how much he needs her to solve the situation. That's right, he didn't fight back when someone assassinated him because he wanted to return where she was still alive. The fact that she died because of him bothered him so much to the point where he was going insane about it. But this is the first time he admits that he didn't want to die. <sighs> now we won't struggle to translate his Zundere language.
For the first time, he didn't want to die, so he regressed for the tenth time. Also, this was the first that Kit regressed during her 19th birthday party, because the last time she did, it was always before the carriage accident. Just then, Edwin suspects that maybe it's because his last words were to save her. When confronted about his thoughts, Edwin brushes off her question, which she doesn't have a problem with. She really has no suspicion towards this man. As they converse about the colorless and odorless poison, Lonnie calls from a distance. Edwin suddenly pulls her closer into the bush, saying that he doesn't want to go back especially if that guy's there. He then caresses the side of her face, asking if she wants to return. Uh, the last time I checked, he smacked Kit's hand when she met him after her regression, and now he's casually doing it to her. Kit smiles. She doesn't want to go back. In fact, she likes it when it's just the two of them. Edwin expected that coming, and with a smirk, he leads her to somewhere with more fun to be at. When she told him that she likes when it's just the two of them, she didn't expect to be alone with him in the library. But it's kind of weird, isn't it? There's nothing after death, yet they regressed and are still able to recall how they died. Kit honestly tells him that it doesn't bother her at all. In fact, she thinks of it as rather futile. Edwin agrees and further adds that usually it hurts as well, so it's not something to take lightly and that she might die again. So he further asks if she doesn't want to regain the time she lost. Of course she does. Not just her time, but theirs. She promises that she won't quit. Edwin is being honest, not to miss pointing out how it might be incredibly painful to die again. But Kit's face says otherwise. She never really learns. But well, if she did, she wouldn't be able to be by his side. Look at her now, talking back to him like they've really grown fond of each other. Suddenly, Kit notices the book, so she asks him if he can still remember who it was. The author, William Day's name, was written on the cover, yet it's gone. Kit then remembered something from yesterday. When she regressed, the name she saw in the book was only a single letter. There, he realizes that before his first regression, there was definitely ten letters of the author's name still written on the book, and a single letter was left after his ninth regression and her first. And now, after Edwin's tenth regression, there's nothing left. Now, he can't regress anymore. We didn't see it coming. I know there are lots of twists and turns in this manhwa, but this? Is there even anything more thrilling than this? Kit is even more paranoid at this point, shouting at him to use his head and figure something out. Edwin, at this point, is feeling hopeless that he won't be able to regress again. Luckily, he has someone who reminds him of his wish, and that is not to die. Edwin's eyes widened upon hearing this. So, there's only one solution to this. Tracing back to when Lonnie was easily released, even with his testimony, how could a commoner possess such capabilities? That only means one thing. There is a mastermind who can control the judiciary. They might have been targeting him, but suddenly the plans changed and Kit died instead. Shifting from the original plan, it must have been hard for them to cover it up. And during the trial, there were many signs of the evidence being destroyed. They must have been confident enough where even if they were to be under suspicion, nothing would have happened to them. Things are still complicated, but one thing's for sure. The mastermind behind his death has always been the same person. But the person who was ordered to assassinate him was different every time. Or so he thinks. So the person who killed Kit last time was Lonnie, so this time another person might be the one to commit the crime. But they only caught a glimpse of the mastermind's tale. It was revealed that there were two people, Lonnie and Richard. Come to think of it, Richard complimented her on the sunflower brooch. But Edwin argues that although there's a high possibility that Lonnie is the culprit, that doesn't mean Richard is off the hook. But after she died, he got very suspicious of everyone, but Richard sincerely tried to comfort him. Also, he had an expression he's never seen him make before a familiar feel to it back when he first lost his father. Simply put, Richard can't be the culprit. Kit then presses her hand onto his, asking if he's fine. Besides Richard, he dealt with, um, investigating everybody he found suspicious. There's only one familiar face left. Lonnie. The mastermind has already started to reveal themselves. They just have to aim for their head rather than their tail, and that's... Suddenly, Edwin's father shows up, but the problem is, he can no longer see him. What did I say about twists and turns? It's exactly occurring one after another. When he confirms from Kit that his father is really around at the time, he laughs about how things turn like this. He lowered his head with his hand on it, saying that he's run out of chances. Suddenly, his father asks him to come back. How come he hears that when the reason he sticks around Kit in the first place was because she was able to hear it alone? Edwin understands what his father is trying to say, so he got up and made up his mind to return to the palace. As they go over the book in the library, Edwin informs her of his two other suspects. 
First is the king, Benson Arthur Windsor, who was third in the line to the throne. He has a pretty strong motive to get rid of Edwin because of that. Before, Edwin didn't have the courage to find out because Benson cared about him more than his father did. But it's the same even now. He then tries to calm himself, hoping that he isn't the culprit or it will really break him whole. Every time Edwin feels bad for everything, Kit is there to comfort him and even makes him laugh about how they met for the first time. Back then, everything still felt like a dream to her, but not with touching anyone's face. She only did that because it was him. Edwin smirks while looking at her. He looks like a proud boyfriend for real. <clears throat> I forgot we're in the middle of investigating the possible suspects here. Moving on, the other person on the list is Arwen Windsor, the Grand Duke and the fourth in line to the throne. He is currently the most influential person in the palace after the king and the person who sent him to this place. And that's the reason why he needs to go back to the palace, to find out the truth of who badly wants him gone. And well, knowing Kit, girl, she's unstoppable. There's no point in trying to stop her. So Edwin instructs her that they will be living together. Uh, I mean, L-E-A-V-I-N-G together in two days at noon. For some reason, Kit somehow feels excited to go to the palace. When the day comes to leave, Kit writes a goodbye letter in the house. Shortly after, as she walks in town, thinking it might be the last time in a long while, she encounters Lonnie, who calls her from behind. And that's it for today, guys. What did you think? As always, don't forget to like the video and comment for the next part so we know you want more. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications for updates. See you in the next one.